This is New Literacies in the Classroom, Digital Capital, Student Identity, and Third Space. I'm Brian Morgan and I'm from SUNY Geneseo. Alternative education in the United States is a place where students who don't thrive in a regular classroom are either sent or voluntarily go. A teacher from one of those programs contacted me about two years ago to help her set up a blog so that her students could take advantage of some internet technology, be more engaged in the reading and writing that she was doing in her English classroom. She knows that almost every student who comes into her classroom now has lived in a world where there's always been computers, there's always been the internet, and that those changes have changed the way that those students think and live and communicate and in fact that some of her students are very engaged in those activities. She also was aware of the fact that those new literacies affected the way that students thought about literacy and the ways that they do literacy. She were more apt to work collaboratively with the workload distributed over the course of time and amongst people. It was more audience centric rather than author-centric writing and that they could use a variety of different modes to convey what they were thinking and to get people to think about things in certain ways. Pretty. Our, our question really boiled down to is what effect would introducing online literacies into the classroom have on pedagogy and student in-school literacy? First space is a, a space that calls on or merges the meanings, knowledges, and practices of the home or the peer networks and communities largely that are informal. Second space is made up of more institutionalized entities such as school, work, church. There have been many conceptualizations of third space. Some originally it was thought of as a sort of geographic space between home and school or home and some colonial entity, for instance. Other people have characterized it as a discursive space. We are conceptualizing as a hybridized space, both discursive and geographic, in which participants can call upon the meanings and practices of first and second space in order to negotiate or navigate their existence in first and second space and in the conflict between spaces. Third space is then a resource and an actual discursive and geographic space. We propose that one way to think about adolescence and others' experience and adeptness with online literacy and new literacies is as digital capital, a form of or sort of manifestation of cultural capital. Digital capital has a relation to the three forms of cultural capital, the embodied, the instrumental, and the institutional. Very briefly, in the case of digital capital, embodied is practices, actions, and dispositions such as gaming, online researching rather than print research, hacking, blogging, and so on. Instrumental exists in the form of artifacts and cultural goods, which in this case can include digital abilities and skills, as well as digital and physical artifacts such as computers, Xbox 360, a MySpace account, skilled gaming, good I image manipulation, photoshopping, and so forth. And institutional is the objectification of cultural capital or digital capital so some official worth is put upon it so it can be conferred through a structured sanctioned process such as a digital school assignment a well-constructed and praised kiltacular posted online an online poem at someone's blog or a well-read and commented upon blog post the data for this study comes from blog posts, interviews, and field notes the first year, and the second year we have blog posts, field notes, interviews, and an online survey. We group that data according to certain patterns of meaning we found using multimodal methods of discourse analysis into cases, and then we extracted three telling cases. I will only use two in this presentation. Telling cases that we extracted were Jake, the luckiest guy ever, who was a student from 2006 to 2007, was a 17-year-old white male student. Spartan 117 in the 2007-2008 school year was a 17-year-old white male. And Jake, the luckiest guy ever, who I'm now going to call Jake, his first post, a typical example of what students did their very first posts in that very first year. He consciously chose the name that he had uh, on the blog. Began with Mighty King Jake, but then soon changed to Jake the luckiest guy ever as his name. Well, as you can see from this first blog post, he tells us a lot about himself, but none of this stuff is about school. It's all about how creative he is, what he likes to do and what he finds significant outside of school. And he sort of gives a hint to us that he's, he considers himself and probably is a humorous guy and that he understands the way that blog posts and online writing should appear. He addresses his audience. He signs off. He uses phrases from the web, so to speak and from pop culture in general, and does make kind of a critique of pop culture in his coining of a new 
phrase by the pound. Jake never responded to the literature prompts that the teacher put there, but he wrote quite a bit about himself. Jake presents himself as sort of a goofball, and, and he was known as being like a class clown. Jake, however, is interested in sensitive to some other things in his life. He had really long hair and was very proud of his hair. But in this post he talks about thinking about some people in his life who had been affected by disease and, and had to lose their hair, particularly cancer, and through and chemotherapy. So he completely changes this visual image that he had in school by getting his hair cut short. You know, this Jake is not so absurd as the other Jake. Here again we see a side of Jake that wasn't presented in school and that he didn't present willingly anywhere except on the blog. We get a very interesting insight into Jake's life. This is quite a different person from presented in the first two slides or two posts that I shared with you that Jake produced. Jake has created a rather complex identity on the blog that wasn't recognized in school, wasn't valued in school, and very little use to him in school. His The teacher had thought of that she would allow more out of school type of activities to be included on the on the web that the students could write about what they wanted to write about this next telling case is spartan 117 he presents himself in this in this post as a person obsessed with halo which is true he played halo all the time in fact his survey says that including gaming and music he spent up to 40 hours on the on the web that's spartan 117 displays some real skills and some real knowledge about Halo, but also about web composition. He's able to capture the image of the main character, who he chose as his name, Spartan117, capture that image and Photoshop it, including feathering at the bottom, so that it would fit nicely onto this blog post where he talks about what he thinks is the center of his interest. An analysis of the reality of being a gay adolescent is what I've titled the slide. Partway during the year, this blog post appears, and it's unlike any that we've seen before. And it's entitled The American Iron Cross. And in this blog post, he talks about going to give blood and being rejected because he's gay. In his sense of frustration and anger and disempowerment, just because of who he is and something that's very much a part of his identity, central to his identity, that prevents him from participating not only in general American life, but also prevents him from doing something good. So he's very angry. That American Iron Cross post got a great deal of response from people, particularly the students in my class. They were sharing in Barton 117's outrage. They were giving him solutions to what he could do about this. You know, they were sympathizing with him. And Barton 117 picks one comment and responds to that one as a way of highlighting further and exploring further the issue that he had before him in his life, the thing that was affecting his existence. So you can see here, too, a particular skill in and a knowledge of the conventions of online communication. He captures the quote that he's going to respond to so people can see it and don't have to flip back. He play, he titles the, the post in a way that makes sense and captures completely what the issue is, and he tags it in a way that people can find it. He's talking about society. But what's curious about it is that he talks about what the average teenager would do. He, he knows that he has this rage, this anger about the situation that he's in. He's analyzed his situation, his place in it, and what that means about adolescence in general, about views, of against, uh, views about being gay, giving blood, the role that the American Red Cross has in the, in the, in the uh, United States, and some ways or in most ways does some very powerful analysis and writing and very good thinking. Both Jake and Spartan 117 leave us with fairly complicated representations of their identity. Students were aware of audience. They used the tools they, su they were supposed to and they crafted some very sophisticated and nuanced messages. They read others posts, talked about their literacies outside of school and brought them into school and made them important. They connected their li writing to their lives there was a genuine engagement with their topic, and they conveyed that engagement and that understanding to their audience. So we propose that students should be able to employ their digital capital not disconnected from the figured worlds in which they acquired it and in which it is embodied and recognized and significant, alongside those literacies employed in an academic space, the creation of a negotiated online third space in this case that is both discursive and connected to a geographic physical reality would assist in connecting students to both school 
and school to student to the benefit of both. Thank you.